It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Giles Burgle from the University of Oxford, um, who's going to be speaking about finding and matching printed book illustrations in the National Library of Scotland data foundry. Um, Giles is a digital humanist and a book historian based in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, where he works on applied AI in the humanities and cultural heritage sector with personal research interests in the history of popular print. And without further ado, Giles, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you very much indeed to the organizers for putting uh, today's panel and the events as a whole together. I will just share my screen. Okay, so I'm uh, going to be presenting on a collaboration uh, that I carried out, I and colleagues uh, under the National Library and Library of Scotland's uh, fellowship scheme in digital scholarship. Uh, I'm based in a computer vision research group, uh, which increasingly means an AI research group in the Department of Engineering at Oxford. And the purpose of the collaboration was to apply some of our methods uh, to some materials in the National Library's data foundry. Specifically, it's chapbooks printed in Scotland data sets, which consists of uh, 47,000, over 47,000 image files, metadata for those files, it also includes OCR. Uh, we didn't actually use that in this collaboration, but we also used, very importantly, uh, authorized, uh, curated uh, data from the National Library from their uh, digital gallery. So standardized terms for printers and publishers and so forth. And that was really important, as I hope to make clear. Um, here is one of the items in the digital gallery, a, a, Scot a chapbook printed in Scotland. Uh, if you're not familiar with the genre of chapbooks, they are small, cheap printed books of poetry, prose, uh, 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 drama very occasionally, songs very often, uh, sold and distributed and sold by traveling uh, uh, peddlers or chat men. Often illustrated, uh, the illustrations have sometimes had a, a kind of uh, a rough ride uh, at the hands of chapbook scholars, uh, Ed Cowan and Mike Patterson, and it, what is an excellent guide to uh, the genre in Scotland. Uh, note that it was often felt necessary to ornament the front cover of the picture and a woodcut usually served this purpose. It was fairly crudely executed and made only an indirect solution if any at all to the content. So two parts of this, that uh, these illustrations are cheap and simple and also they're not necessarily related to the content. But they, are, they are kind of uh, free floating uh, memes almost. Uh, here is an original uh, chapbook printer's block uh, used in Newcastle in the 18th century now in the British Museum. I'm showing this in this rather nice RTI uh, view uh, where one has uh, light from various angles and I'm toggling the light backwards and forwards and showing this simulated light, which is very nice for kind of showing the, uh, the, the grooves and the, the grain of the wood and other features as a book historian really delight in. And on the left, you can see an impression of that specific block. Um, the specific block was one of the things we wanted to investigate, we wanted to track during this research. Uh, the procedure we carried out are in three uh, steps, and uh, I've, I've given a brief epitome of the kind of, of the technical methods of each step. The steps were first finding the illustrations using an object detection CNN or convolutional neural network. And for the people interested, I, I've given the name of that particular CNN. Uh, further technical details are available on our website. Next step was to match and group the illustrations per unique block. Again, there's some uh, description of the methodology there. SIFT features, a form of computer vision that predates uh, the current AI boom, still very useful. And last, I did a bit of experimental work in classifying the subjects or content of the illustrations with, again, a CNN. I'm not sure how many people are with these terms, but I'll, I'll, I'll show them in action through this, uh, through this collaboration. So step one, finding illustrations. We used a generic object detector, a uh, form of uh, a neural network, a classifier, uh, commonly used, for example, for identifying objects in the wild, such as, in this case on the left, uh, uh, trams, uh, people, umbrellas, and other things that you might want to isolate within a scene. So there's two parts of this. There is the identification of a thing and the localization of it in, in, in space. And on the right, you can see us uh, applying this detector to the illustration. So you can see here a view of all the pages in the NLS data set. And we are interested in just finding the illustrations. And what we're doing here is annotating the pages with example illustrations, which we then want the 
object of Texas to go and find on its own initiative. So uh, I wish it, to cut a long story short, it did very successfully. We successfully extracted uh, 3,600 illustrations from the 40,000 page images. There were some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, speed bumps and, and some, some uh, misdetections, rather few actually. They did much better than we thought. Uh, those are documented in a publication that are coming, come out of this research. And uh, we then open sourced the retrain model for reuse. And it has been used already on other illustrations. Um, and actually all the technology used for this collaboration is uh, free and open source. Uh, next step uh, was to make these images browsable, uh, which we do in this uh, web-based demo here. I'll provide the link to that later in the chat. And you can see, for example, we are making use of the NLS's authority files to provide a kind of browsable overview of the iconography available to printers in this case, in particular locations. And that's a kind of great way for kind of browsing the popular visual culture of a particular locality at some time. And you can immediately see certain stylistic patterns. So this is clearly the work of uh, the same or, or very similar block cutters working for the firm of J.R. Robertson in Glasgow in the late 18th and 19th century. And I don't think Parquet, Ted Cowan and all these are crude woodcuts. I mean, these are very sophisticated design in some cases. Uh, a lot of care has been taken. Uh, other examples are perhaps close to the stereotypical notion of a crude chapbook woodcut, but I would argue that nonetheless, these are, are provide a powerful form of visual identity, and moreover, they're suited to the cheapness of the paper that these items are printed on, and also the intended popular uh, target market. Okay, so that was illustration detection and in make, leveraging metadata for browser illustrations. Next, we want to match and group the illustrations per block using so-called SIFT features. For this, we use a software package called VISE, the VGG Image Search Engine. Uh, you can see it here being used to find buildings in Oxford from various angles. These little red ellipsoids are features extracted from different images, which we then match. And we can efficiently match millions of images quickly um, that are from multiple angles and at different scales. Um, uh, very often you can see this, there's, there's a side shot and front on shot here of this famous building in Oxford. And this technique, again, like our objects text are not designed for print, but it turns out to work extremely well. So here we have a view of our browse and search tool. And then uh, this video playing is pulling down the uh, metadata for a publisher. And uh, I'm going to Hutchison again in Glasgow, and I'm selecting an item. You can see items here, and I can uh, bring out one of them here that has no metadata. So there's sparse metadata, or only sparse metadata in the Yellowstone record. So I can lasso a woodcut and perform a visual search, and it very quickly returns matching illustrations. I can go in on one of them and reassure myself that I am looking at the same block, an image off the same block and not a first copy. If I like, I can go in and see the visual features that have been matched. And I'll also look at the metadata for the match and I can see there's much more metadata here. So you can see how the visual search is, is bridging between materials that have uh, much metadata and those that don't. So we have some other features here so we can upload a picture if we want. In this tool here, we have we can do clusters of matched illustrations. So here are sets that have two images, and we go up to over 24, I believe, is the most in this set. Uh, yes, 22. Uh, and here it is easy to see, therefore, is the most popular imagery, which kind of blocks are being reused over and over again in this corpus. And again, those are the two blocks I saw earlier, uh, you saw earlier, um, which actually move around. Those move around between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and close copies of them are used elsewhere. Okay, so that was matching, notification. We see uh, immensely you know, a piece of software called VIC, is the image classification engine. And this is the sort of thing one might use to find objects or kind of classes of imagery broadly to find whether that's concrete things such as cats or dogs or, or more abstract properties such as. Uh, style or color or texture. Uh, for example, um, here I'm applying a, a small set of uh, printer's ornaments that are taken from Google, just random printer's and ornaments that are not part of the data set of the chapbook's data set. And I want to use these as a visual query. So I use Vic 
to index these images and present that to Vic as a search term, effectively. So a search term made of Muslim just printed ornaments. And we find there are some things that are relevant, but if you're familiar with uh, machine learning, you see the usual mixture of things that are absolutely what you're looking for and things that are perhaps less closely related, in some cases aren't related at all. So in the second row, you can see an image of Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden. This is not strictly speaking ornaments, this, this figure here, but to some extent, you can see what the system means. You can, you can kind of get an idea of the features that are, that are, that are quote unquote similar across the corpus. And as you go down within this set, you see things are decreasingly relevant as you should. I had more luck finding sailing ships. Um, there are some things at the bottom that aren't relevant, but they have been tagged as not relevant through this yellow triangle, this disclosure triangle here, whereas things that are more relevant have a green tick. This is not a ship either. This is a, a lady with a, in a kind of triangular dress. But again, you can kind of see the features that the classifier is picking up on. And you can see how this kind of rather serendipitous form of search works. Things like portraits, uh, that work rather well. Portraits of Robert Burns in this case, but any kind of portrait at all, that was uh, relatively uh, straightforward. And I think yeah, kind of, um, research continues uh, to provide kind of meaningful uh, uh, categories that uh, users might uh, might want to, to look for, or, or if not uh, specific keyworded categories, they can use this technology to browse the collection without any knowledge necessarily of what it contains and prior knowledge. Next steps are to devise a cataloging standard for blocks, their impressions and, relate, and related blocks. Uh, wood blocks do survive um, at, or can be inferred as I've shown from their impressions. Uh, if they do survive, uh, they are, there are no standards currently that bridge their description as might take place, for example, in museums or as might used be libraries, uh, nor are there good ways of describing interrelationships between copies of blocks, close copies of blocks, you know, which one might want to do in order to distinguish them and to show visual learnages in what was uh, the most far-reaching corpus of popular imagery as well as song, prose, and, and, uh, and, and uh, poetry available to working people in Scotland in the late 18th, early 19th century. This would be re requisite to assign identifiers to the illustrations that make Braswell based on this standard and to publish uh, that improved metadata for, in some cases, a newly identified printer and location of printing for the anonymous material. And we also want on a technical level to scope the integration of technology uh, using IIIF, uh, which clearly uh, many institutions are investing in. Again, LS already has a IIIF standard, and we're actively uh, considering that right now. Just a few thanks. Uh, numerous people, I won't go through, the, the National Library of Scotland. Uh, it's a fantastic collaboration, which continues. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleague, Abhishek Dutta, who's a research software engineer in BGG in Oxford, and uh, a number of chapbook scholars and collections elsewhere are very helpful. Uh, you can get these slides at this URL, which I'll put in the chat. The presentation will, of course, be available as well. Uh, there is a live demo, the demo that I showed showing matching the message data browser at this address. Uh, the code, as I said, is open source. The data from the NLS is, of course, still available from the NLS. And we have various other tools, demos, and uh, research agendas you can see on our website. And I'm very happy to take questions at the end of this panel, but also by email later. Thank you very much. Great. Well, Giles, thank you. That was terrific. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on the back of, of that very stimulating presentation. Um, thank you very much. And now I think we move directly on to our second presentation, which is pre-recorded, um, but uh, entitled A New Vision for the National Archives Catalogue, Revealing the Richness of Records, which Alex Green and Faith Lawrence from the National Archives have uh, produced. Um, they're going to be presenting um, Project Omega, the National Archives project to rejuvenate um, uh, the catalogue editorial systems and to create a pan-archival catalogue which brings together data from across um, the National Archive. So um, without, again, without further ado, um, we will uh, have the presentation. Thank you. My name is Faith Lawrence and I am a data analyst for the Catalogue Taxonomy and Data Department and also Product Manager for Project Omega. I am joined for this presentation by my colleague Alex Green, who is the Pan Archival Catalogue service owner of which Project Omega is part.
The National Archives is the UK government's archives and official publisher. As such, our collections reflect a thousand odd years of British and world history. Being the record of government, our records include a lot of death, taxes and random bureaucracy. But, being the record of government, there is also plenty of sex, scandal and intrigue, resulting in a diverse collection that even we at Kew are still exploring the depths of. The formats are diverse as well, even on the physical side. As well as paper files and rolls of parchment, we have maps, photographs, artworks and fabric samples, wax seals, doors and even the odd mummified rodent. And increasingly, we are now acquiring born digital objects, including emails, databases and archived websites. In 2019, the National Archives launched their Archives for Everyone initiative with the goal of making the archive more inclusive, entrepreneurial and disruptive. This talk will mostly focus on the inclusive and disruptive aspects as I discuss the current and future plans for the catalogue. For many people, their first introduction to the archive is via our online catalogue, Discovery. This is the public face of the catalogue, with records related to over 25 million assets, both physical and digital, and an additional 11 million records related to items held at other archives around the country. I will now hand you over to Alex, who will describe our future vision for the catalogue. Behind our online catalogue, there is a collection of databases and software that allow us to manage the 32 million record descriptions you can see on Discovery. When you search or browse Discovery, it may seem that little changes, but in a typical year, well over half a million record descriptions are added, 5,400 are amended in response to user suggestions, and many thousands become open. All of these changes are managed using an editorial system designed in 1999. Since then, we've thought a lot about records and how they are used. We know that more is learned about them, which changes our understanding over time. Also since then, technology has linked the world through the internet, which allows us to connect our records in new ways, not only within our own catalogue, but to others. In Project Omega, we have the chance to radically rethink how we use the information we have about our records. This slide shows a variety of linked data held by other organisations worldwide. What if our records were linked to other records, to those elsewhere in our catalogue, or in other archives in the UK, or in museums, galleries and archives all over the world? What if you could see the changes made to record descriptions in the catalogue? For example, you could view the new description, enhanced by one of the catalogue projects, such as the War Diaries of the Second World War, alongside the old description, alongside any errors that were corrected, such as a date or a spelling, which might have made the record harder to find in the past. What if you could see more information about a record, such as what conservation actions have been performed on a medieval deed, what software a digital file was created in, or whether a digital record had been altered since it came into the archive. This is the vision for our new catalogue, and all of this will be possible when the project is complete. Here's our project roadmap, our plan. You can see that we have more detail for the rest of this year and less for the following year, as we can't be as certain about what will be possible. This year, we're focusing on converting the core of our catalogue, the main information you see on Discovery, into linked data and validating that it's correct, designing the technical architecture to ensure that other systems at TNA can receive and send data back to the catalogue to ensure that it holds the canonical version of information about our records, and designing the new editorial interface to allow staff to create and edit the catalogue data in a way that makes their work easier, more efficient, and preserves a record of those changes over time. I'll now hand you back to Faith to give more detail about how this is being achieved. The public catalogue is underpinned by the internal cataloguing system and editorial process. This process is how new records are added and corrections and other improvements are made. However, behind the scenes, it is made up of multiple overlapping databases, resulting in multiple potential points of failure due to the complex interactions between the different data stores and, in some cases, the lack of a clearly definitive version. Further, the editorial application has reached what is known as end of life. That is, it is no longer supported. 
and as a result of the age of the technology, it is not possible to make any changes to improve usability or make other quality of life improvements. The challenge facing us is to create a new back-end catalogue system. As we are going behind the scenes of designing this potential system, I'm going to get a little bit technical, but I will do my best to explain as I go along to try and keep everything clear for those who are not from a technical background. With the idea of the disruptive archive in mind, we want to take the opportunity to not just replace the existing system, but to take advantage of recent technology improvements to create something much better. When I say better, this has two parts. Firstly, better for the archivists and editors who are updating and maintaining the catalogue to make the workflow easier, more user-friendly and more efficient. And secondly, and indirectly, making it better for the public users by making it easier to search, share and expose the data in the catalogue and provide better support for the new front-end system that is also being developed. One of the most exciting things about Project Omega is that we had the opportunity to start from a completely blank slate rather than trying to build on an existing system. So some of the first questions that we had to ask was what type of technology would be the best fit for what we and our data needed. The National Archives has an ambition to lead the world in reimagining archival practice for the 21st century including new approaches to archival description. So we were given the chance to completely rethink our catalogue and we wanted to take advantage of the latest technology and archival thinking. In 2020, ICA published its new framework for archival description, Records in Contexts. We loved their view of records as part of a vast dynamically interrelated network of people and objects situated in space and time. We know that records are initially created by an organisation or possibly more than one in these digital times and then subsequently other organisations inherit those records using and adding to them over time and then once they are transferred to the archive the records are used again by generations of researchers with more and more connections being made between people, corporate bodies and records by these activities. We decided to redesign our data model to reflect all of these connections, as well as the traditional arrangement of records according to the principles of respect to form and original order. Our new data model also gives us the opportunity to model records in a new way, one that separates out the aspects of each record which are unchanging, which we call the concept, from the specifics of what is delivered to the user, which we've termed the realisation. This is especially useful for born digital records, which can have multiple versions due to redactions or versions in a different format. But we wanted to extend this to all records to allow us the freedom to describe and differentiate between every type of record we have. In addition, we recognise that the descriptions we receive from the government departments that transfer the records are not the only valid descriptions. Our new data model will enable us to incorporate alternative and complementary viewpoints from other sources by separating out different descriptions for the same concept of a record. These could come from crowdsourcing projects or even be generated by artificial intelligence. Finally, we wanted to find a way to be transparent in our archival practices, so the new catalogue will include a full audit trail of any changes made to the records and their metadata. Instead of deleting data, every change will be saved as a new version so that users can view how a record and its catalogue entry has changed over time. So these are the key characteristics we needed in the catalogue to achieve our ambitions, but what about the technology? It was with these factors in mind that we decided to go in the direction of graph technology. Closely associated with the idea of linked data, which has grown in popularity over the last few years as it has moved from academia to enterprise level implementation. Graph databases have some similarities to XML databases in that they encode both the data and the relationships between the data. While an XML database is constrained by a defined hierarchical structure, graph databases have a freer network structure, although to get the most out of a system, a data model, schema or ontology will define how the different types of data fit together. 
But what does this mean for archives? I would like to give you a visual idea of the difference between our current approach to cataloguing records compared to the possibilities of our future catalogue. The current catalogue is modelled in the blue diagram on the lower left. Each series belongs to a single department and each record belongs to one series. And if that record mentions a named individual, it is only sometimes tagged as a person. More often the name is not tagged, but it is just part of the text of the description, so there is no way of searching specifically for a person of that name. There is no mention of earlier descriptions of the record, and you can't see differently redacted versions of a digital record that have been available in the past. The future catalogue, however, shows all of this. It enables us to see that a record not only belongs to the series it was placed in by the government department when it was transferred, but it also belongs to a series of records that were loaned to the British Library for an exhibition. This catalogue would show you any other records that were included in that exhibition, not only those from TNA's collection, but ideally the records loaned from other archives. Also in this new model, we can see that two individuals are linked to a single record, but no link exists between those two people. Their link to the record, however, allows us to discover another person who may be of relevance to our research. The future catalogue also shows us different versions of a description over time as catalogue enhancement projects, user suggestions and corrections have changed it. And finally, the redacted record is still available, even when the full record has been opened, allowing us to see what information was considered sensitive previously. This is just a flavour of what will be possible with the new catalogue. This level of detail is facilitated by our new data model because, unlike the current system, but similar to further functional requirements for bibliographic records, it models three levels of conceptualisation for a given record or record set. Concept, a record transferred to TNA and asserted as a new intellectual entity under, within TNA's control. Description, a record will have one or more descriptions which will facilitate and document TNA's intellectual control over that entity. And finally, realisation. A record will have one or more realisations which will facilitate and document TNA's control over the actual bits, physical or digital, that make up the record. So each piece of information in the current system needs to be recorded at the correct conceptual layer or layers. The catalogue is the heart of any archive. If we make our new catalogue and editorial system correctly, it will help keep the information flowing smoothly around the different systems that make up TNA, only a fraction of which are depicted on this slide. We are going through a period of change here at the Archive. Not just the catalogue and the editorial workflows, but a significant number of these other systems are also currently undergoing re-evaluation and redevelopment. This offers an amazing opportunity for growth and improvement but means that many of the decisions that we have to make are part of a wider conversation about how these new systems, some beginning to go into production and others only just beginning to be thought about, will work together. As you saw in our roadmap, the data is only one strand of many in this project, and while we have been focusing on it over the past year, in part to verify our data model and ensure we are building on a solid foundation, it is not our only concern. Deciding on the technical approach for the API, that is, how the different systems will communicate with each other, requires consensus across the different projects, and Omega is in the forefront of that conversation, because our final product will connect to so many of the other systems around TNA. I hope that this talk has given you a glimpse into the work that we've been doing on Project Omega, and some of the complexities that we've been grappling with as we start making our dream for a pan-archival catalogue of reality. The link at the bottom of this slide is the Project Omega webpage, which contains ongoing details of the project and links to the reports and resources related to it. If you have any questions about Project Omega and the future direction of the catalogue, you can contact us at catalogueprojects at nationalarchives.gov.uk. Thank you for listening. Super. Well, Alex and Faith, thank you very much indeed for that uh, presentation. Um, really um, uh, of the moment, uh, I think, in terms of the kind of IT challenge that a number of organisations are going through, um, but um, uh, something which will, as you say, make a big difference um, 
uh, to users. Um, so thank you uh, very much. And then that takes us um, uh, with questions in the final part of this session, of course, it takes us to our third presentation um, by Holly Smith um, from the University of Leeds Special Collections, Documenting Complex Histories, Balancing Multifaceted Representation with Accessible Archive Navigation. Um, Holly is the project archivist working on the Women's Aid Federation of England archive within the University of Leeds Special Collections. And today she's going to be introducing us to the Women's Aid Archive, as well as discussing some of the research that she's been undertaking as part of her TNA and RLUK professional fellowship. So um, again, there's a, a recorded presentation. And after this, we will move into uh, questions. Uh, so can we play the presentation, please? Hello, my name is Holly Smith. I have brown hair, a slightly unruly fringe, and I'm currently wearing a navy and white striped top. Um, I'm here today as the project archivist for the Women's Ed Federation of England Archive, which is currently being catalogued as part of a Welcome Trust funded project. As well as this, I'm currently taking part in a professional fellowship in partnership with the National Archives and Research Libraries UK. For this, I chose to research inclusive cataloguing practice, namely the balancing of representation and accessibility, uh, which I'll be talking to you about today. So documenting complex layered descriptions that authentically represent the voices in an archive is quite the holy grail for archive projects at the moment. But equally, we can't forget the importance of ensuring simplicity with easy navigation and standardized finding aids and access points. So it's these two sides that seem slightly at odds with each other. But nonetheless, that's what I've decided to explore and uh, what we'll hopefully be unpicking a little bit today. But before I start, I do have a couple of admin points. Firstly, I'd like to flag that Women's Aid is a domestic abuse charity uh, and our archive interacts with various sensitive issues around this topic. I won't be overtly mentioning the details of domestic abuse during this presentation, but I will be sharing some images from the archive as well as bringing up Women's Aid and the services they provide. Therefore, I will be sharing some details at the end uh, for anyone that may feel affected by anything they've seen. The second caveat before I begin is that this presentation mainly revolves around my still ongoing fellowship. Um, I'm currently about to hit the halfway mark and it's so far it's been a lot of me asking quite broad questions around inclusivity, representation and access. So I'm afraid there's nothing too concrete and groundbreaking for me to share at this point. So what this is going to be is a bit more of a discussion, which I'm hoping isn't too underwhelming for you all. Um, I hope it will inspire you to maybe go back to your archives and have similar discussions with your teams there. Um, so to kick things off, I want to give you a bit of background about the Women's Aid Federation of England. So Women's Aid is an acclaimed domestic abuse charity that works as the national coordinating body for local domestic abuse services. It provides information, training and resources, as well as lobbying and campaigning for women's rights and legislative change. Women's Aid has been at the forefront of the refuge movement for almost half a century, celebrating its 50th anniversary in 2024. So because of this, the Women's Aid archive goes back to around 1974, when the organisation was formally established. They emerged out of the activism surrounding the women's liberation movement and were back then known as the National Women's Aid Federation, or NWAF, as you can see from some of the things on the slide now. So they were initially seen as quite radical activists, raising awareness of quite taboo subjects such as domestic abuse and gendered violence. But our archive tells an incredible narrative of perseverance and progress. In the span of just 20 years, Women's Aid transforms from being an organisation met with scepticism and aggression to one that was highly respected for its original research and expertise. They even held their 30th birthday celebrations in 10 Downing Street. So as you can kind of start to see from this very brief introduction, the Women's Aid Archives more than a simple label of women's history. It's complex and it spans the histories of activism, law, feminism, the refuge movement. And within Women's Aid, within women's Aid itself in the archive, we can see uh, special interest groups for women who identify as black, lesbian, disabled, working class. 
the question is, how do we kind of document this complexity in our catalogues? And how do we make it discoverable for researchers? Truthfully, I'm still trying to figure that out. But today I'm hoping to talk you through three of the main discussions I've been having. So first off will be the importance of community communication. Secondly, the idea of recording user generated content. And thirdly, uh, the services we provide with current cataloging practices. So first, I'm going to talk about community communication. And by this, I mean how we can build up relationships with the groups represented in our archives. So for us, the main contender here is Women's Aid themselves. We want the Women's Aid archive to authentically represent the functionality of their organization. So I made sure to have Women's Aid representatives provide feedback on things like our collection structure. I also use the expertise of staff members to double check the names of key groups and individuals that cropped up in the records and also ask them a lot of annoying questions like the administrative difference between the Women's Aid Council and the Women's Aid Council of Trustees. It's just small little interventions like that and often it is just simply confirming what you've found already in the archive. But in doing so, we ensure a more accurate representation of Women's Aid voice. Um, I've also been able to use this communication with Women's Aid to discuss uh, the nuances of representation through appropriate language. Our archive is not without its fair share of historic terminology, one of the main examples being the term battered wives, which you can see here on the left of the screen. It was used by Women's Aid themselves throughout the 70s and the start of the 80s. And we do want to make sure that this is documented as part of their history, but we also want to back it up with the current terminology. So through discussions with Women's Aid, we learnt that victim survivor is the most widely accepted term at the moment. It's the one they currently use and it's the one that women from refuges are most likely to feel represented by. Um, the project has also benefited with close communication with Feminist Archive North, whose collections are also housed in the Uni of Leeds Special Collections. So Feminist Archive North, also known as FAN, is entirely run by volunteers and a lot of whom were involved themselves in the activism of the women's liberation movement. This makes FAN a really great group for engaging with us, as for a lot of them, this is their story. Uh, we recently had a tour for them in the collection. Um, we got out some stuff we thought they'd enjoy and the main aim was kind of just to introduce them to the women's aid material. But we actually ended up getting some great tidbits of info from their responses to the records. So for example, if you see on the screen here, the You Can't Be A Woman poster, this image of the kind of grandma cartoon comes up quite a lot in early ephemera. And fan were able to say that they used to know the artist, Annie Smith, who was known as Vega or V-E-G-A at the time. So it's that kind of feedback that provides a level of personal detail and kind of presents the level of info that you can't get from a Google search. I think it highlights how engagement with relevant groups can really enrich our understanding and documentation of a collection. So this kind of leads me quite nicely on to the topic of uh, user generated content, which I've been really intrigued by recently. And I know it's a bit of a debate in the archive world. So the question is, how can we record and preserve the information gathered from these engagement events like the one I had with FAN? Because I think this is kind of intrinsically linked to the idea of representation in collections and also the accessibility. So the starting point for this debate in my head was the Collections Trust Revisiting Collections programme. So for those of you who haven't heard of it before, the Revisiting Collections initiative encourages institutions to open up their collections for engagement with community groups with the aim of collecting and preserving interpretations users might have. I think this is amazing in theory. It provides that link between engagement and the catalogue, but the Revisiting Collections initiative isn't without its flaws. So the Collections Trust themselves have shared evidence in a 2013 report that despite encouraging meaningful interaction, inspiring community knowledge, etc., um, the results of the sessions were actually rarely preserved. This can partly come down to the theory of it all. Um, so should we as archivists be recording this user-generated content? It's kind of a non-expert metadata um, in inverted commas. Uh, it isn't exactly part of ISAD G. It's definitely at odds with the traditional idea of the archivist as a gatekeeper. So it really is a bit of a debate of whether we should be recording it in the first place. 
But personally, I think these views are getting increasingly outdated and instead it comes down to the practicalities of it all. So there isn't really anywhere to star this content in our current data verses. There's a quote in the 2013 report that puts it quite nicely. Uh, revisiting collections is trying to put stuff in a shoebox that doesn't quite fit. So I guess a good way of explaining this is a case study from our own special collections here at Leeds. So we house the Gypsy Traveller Roma collections, which is a great documentation of nomadic culture, but a lot of it comes from an academic perspective, very much from an eye of an observer. So as part of a Revisiting Collections initiative, the project part with Leeds Gypsy and Traveller Exchange to hear the perspectives of people from within these communities. So this created this amazing added layer of description for the archives, but the thing is there wasn't really a place to star it in the database. This was worked around at the time by putting on the YAN website. Uh, so for those who don't know, YAN is kind of a platform that allows people to collate material and um, write up blog-like descriptions. But the thing is that YAN isn't supported by our organisation. It doesn't link to our catalogue in any way and there's no confirmation of long-term preservation. This user-generated content therefore ends up being not discoverable and not accessible to researchers which feels like it gives a disservice both to them and to the communities that provided it in the first place. So for the Women's Aid Archive, I want to make sure that any metadata gathered from Women's Aid, FAN or any other engagement is appropriately starred. But it's, not just some, uh, it's just not something that our databases are currently set up to do. I think in the meantime, it's an archive by archive basis. We need to look at our databases at fields that don't have a role already can be represented on the online catalogue and are perhaps searchable um, through researchers online. It's one to think about really, and it's one that we need to start thinking of solutions for because more and more archives are producing these similar hidden history projects. We should start thinking beforehand about how we can preserve the user-generated content that might come from them, as I think it has a real potential to open up collections to be more representative and to be more accessible to people um, by being inclusive to lots of different audiences. So following on from that quite theoretical sorry, discussion around current database limitations, it feels like a good time to discuss the things we actually can do now uh, to make our collections both representative and accessible. So subject classification seemed to me to be the first part of call for creating more access points for the Women's Aid Archive, kind of a way of flagging the key voices and key topics in a collection. But I was taken aback by how underused it was both in my own workplace and the wider archives I talked to, with some archivists admitting they don't assign subjects as part of their cataloguing workflow. So a recent project we've undertaken at Special Collections is the LGBTQ plus archive internship, which looks at how best to, serve it, to surface LGBTQ plus stories in our university archive collection. And for this, subject classification was a big theme. So they were particularly grappling with the tricky issue of um, how different people can be identified with different terms and trying to understand which um, subjects to pick out. So to work through this, they carried out focus groups that brought the community themselves into the decision-making process, ensuring terms were more relevant, appropriately, appropriate and sensitively applied. So setting out our approach to subject classification, therefore made LGBTQ plus voices in our archive way more discoverable. So I think another um, obvious call is finding aids and um, using index lists in particular to supplement catalogue records can be a simple yet effective way of, of improving accessibility. So our Women's Ed project currently has two indexing volunteer projects, one looking at the VHS collection and one uh, looking at the newspaper clipping collection. So I can already tell these are going to be amazing um, outcomes. They're really opening up areas of the archive that would otherwise have been incredibly overwhelming to approach single-handedly. So that's kind of subject indexing and finding aids. And another one that I just wanted to mention is collections guides. They really provide a contextual information and some hints, on hints and tips on how to start exploring collections. So for us, the 50th anniversary of Women's Aid is coming up in 2024, and we're aiming to produce a guide to help users dive into this last half a century of history. 
So this is going to include helpful information such as highlighting key people, organisations and dates, as well as listing relevant legislation, which is quite um, useful for Women's Aid history, and explaining the insane number of acronyms that Women's Aid seem to use over the years. So I guess with all of these very simplistic um, things that you can do with catalogues at the moment, it's all about just putting yourself in the position of the user. So what knowledge would help them access these histories? What do they need to know about the collection beforehand? And what access points can we provide for them? It's all super simple stuff, but it's maybe worth just taking a step back sometimes and thinking about the different ways we can open up our catalogues. So hopefully that outlines some of the thoughts that have been whizzing around my head rather manically since I started my fellowship back in February. So until we start playing around with our databases and shaking up how we present our catalogues, some of these thoughts can be quite hypothetical. But then on the other hand, a lot of them are also incredibly simple. And I am very aware I've basically just told a room full of archive professionals how to use subject classifications and finding aids. But having these discussions, however simple, about how we can improve our cataloging approaches to make our archives as representative, accessible and inclusive as possible is so important and should be something that is ongoing in our work. So in the second half of my TNA RL UK Fellowship, I hope to continue working with these principles in mind. Time will tell how well the case study of the Women's Aid Archive as an inclusive catalogue will turn out, but please do stay tuned. And thank you very much for listening to me today. Great. Well, Holly, thank you very much. Um, a very interesting presentation, and I'm sure it'll excite um, some questions. So um, that is the last of the, our three presentations. And so I'm now going to invite all the panelists to turn on their cameras. Um, and we will move into the question session. Um, and um, I think the uh, as as I said at the beginning, uh, questions uh, should come through the uh, uh, through the chat function, um, and um, and they are open. But perhaps while um, people are thinking, I could uh, I could um, direct a question toward Giles. Um, um, Really interested uh, to see this work and the power, really, of the uh, uh, of the AI uh, search uh, facility. And I'm just wondering um, whether um, this has a pl applicability in, for example, um, early printing um, and the identification of sorts, uh, particular sorts, and the degradation of sorts as they use by printers to put the ink on the paper, um, and um, uh, and so on. So um, probably someone's already doing this. It's probably already coming down the track. But I'd be interested to hear. They are already doing this, and this is very exciting. So um, in particular, some research at Carnegie Mellon University, a really great interdisciplinary collaboration between Chris Warren, who's an early modern literature specialist, mm -hmm. scientists and librarians and book historians and digital humanists, on a project called Printing Probability that has uh, already identified some um, texts whose printer and place of publication has been unknown important. Uh, texts or, uh, works by Thomas Hobbes, uh, um, John Milton. Um, mm -hmm. This has been done manually for something extremely painstakingly for some time, but you know, being it is. at scale over yeah. uh, hundreds of millions of, uh, of uh, pieces of type, all yeah. larger things. So, I mean, the technology I showed me uh, does that has this application for uh, you know woodcuts, but ornaments, pieces of type other bibliographical features. I mean, we're beginning to think mm -hmm. in terms of there being a whole new sub-discipline of print studies, yeah. Yeah. And bibliography. but yeah, I think there's going to be just a stream of data coming out as more and more material is digitized and tools like this become more and more mainstream. Mm -hmm. Well, most interesting. I have a personal interest um, in early music printing as a musicologist, and um, there are some really bespoke um, uh, publications from the pre-1550 era, which um, you can't imagine that there would be a vast market for them. So where they got their type from and um, uh, is an enduring question that I'll just leave it lying there and um, uh, hope that, um, well, if someone can come to my rescue, that would be great. But Giles, that's really, um, really interesting. Thank you. Um, so um, looking then um, uh, to the uh, 
Q and A function. Um, there's nothing appearing there yet, but there is a question in the chat, which is to Faith and Alex from Karen Sayers, uh, who asks whether the changes to discovery will affect the way that external repositories can contribute their records and also whether additional data will, sorry, about changes to the records of external repositories, um, will, sorry, will that uh, data become available? That is a very interesting question. So um, there's currently a project which is looking at changing the front end, the public catalogue, uh, which is a separate project. So we haven't 100% worked out how the changes to the back end of the catalogue are going to be reflected in the front end of the catalogue. Um, and there's also the sort of two sides of it in terms of the, um, uh, you know, we can only have the data that we're given. So mm -hmm. it might well be that, you know, we know how we're going to redo the underlying data for our catalogue. In the future, it would be very interesting to take in the data where we're getting it from other people's uh, catalogues and uh, that's going through. Um, if when we get changes, those changes will probably be held as part of the data model if we've converted it over. So you will see those changes in the audit trail, but we'll only get it when those are sent through. So you know, we're, we won't be creating any new information that we're not being sent through from external archives. Um, but ideally, any information we have can be passed on to the reader because it's the researcher and the reader and the person in the public who are looking at it who find that information uh, useful, hopefully. So, you know, there is going to be some discussions about maybe some of the levels of detail in terms of like, are we saying exactly who made the change or is that a more generic thing, just, you know, a change was made? Because, uh, you know, we, we don't like to name names in the civil service, except, you know, if we're trying to win an election or something. Um, so, you know, there are a few discussions still to be had about exactly how that will play out. And it should be said those discussions are a bit in the future. So it's not going to be an immediate thing because obviously we need to work with our own data first before we start thinking about other people's data. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that answered it. Alex, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Uh, only I'm looking at your, your first question, Karen, will the changes affect the way that the external repositories contribute their records? Um, yeah, it's the same answer. We we don't know. We we If it does, then we will be very clear about what those changes are and um, help any, give you any help that you would need. Um, but yeah, it, it may, it may be that we, that there isn't any change and we try and keep it as, as consistent as possible but again I think it's a way I'm off i gonna say it's mm. fair to say that as part of the design process we were very aware that we are getting data from mm. in our case uh parts of the government for whom it, there is already a certain amount of overhead in giving us that data and the chances of being able to change what they're giving mm. us or getting them to give us more or in more detail is probably fairly low so the idea is to it will be to minimise extra work for any external uh, data suppliers. Definitely. Oh, Andrew, you're muted. Right. I'm not sure I did that, but anyway, there we are. Um, right. Um, so. Uh, this is a this is a long term project, um, the Omega uh, project, and it's really just wh where do you see it ending? Is there an end point to it? I realised when I started, I should have said for anybody who is uh, doesn't have visuals, I have light brown hair which is slicked back in a bun because it's really hot, glasses, and an alien landscape with an alien creature behind me as my background, which is giving me a very nice halo effect. Um, so. I think I'm, I'm not going to take that as an answer, but yes. Yes, <laughs> I, I just realised we, we'd been asked to give the descriptions, and I'd forgotten sure. when I started speaking. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so I think there are two end. Well, there is a medium endpoint, and then a fuzzy, fuzzy endpoint. So the first sort of endpoint will when will be when we switch over to using the new system. 
So the current system, as we mentioned, is on its last legs. Mm -hmm. We don't really know how long it will last. So the priority is to be able to switch over to the new system and do the current work that we are currently doing with the new system, hopefully in a way that is easier for our catalogers and editors and make their life a bit easier. Um, but then we've got a whole long to-do list of improvements we would like to make to the system. So, and other data that we'd like to bring in. So we're starting with the born physical data because that's what the current editorial system uses, but we want to bring in the born digital, the digitized. When we started looking, we found there were over 10 different catalogs around, and I use the term very loosely, some of them are spreadsheets, some of them are probably notes on post-its. So we'd very much like to amalgamate all that data into the single catalog. That's what will make it the pan archival catalog. So that will keep us busy for years, but it will be a gradual improvement. Um, and hopefully most of that won't necessarily be as visible uh, from the front end, except that more data will hopefully be made available as it's brought together more for a few bits are available, but they're coming in different pathways. So this will be amalgamating it and making it easier on the back end. Mm. So, I mean, I think the end point will probably be, I mean, the current system lasted 20 years. In 20 years, we might decide that, okay, we need to build a new system rather than keep improving this one. Um, but, you know, the catalog will never go away. So, okay. Um, the, the, there is going to be an endpoint when we're using it, but then we will have continual and iterative improvement from that point on until we, I don't know, switch over to quantum computers or all upload ourselves to the internet or whatever the next stages of digital interaction. Yeah, yeah. And, and just as a follow up, I hope you won't think this is unfair, but are there any plans to link images into the catalogue? Yes. Uh, short answer. Um, okay. So obviously most of those are part of the digital data um, mm -hmm. or, you know, even when they're coming in and born physical, they've now been digitized. So that's sort of, we've got to do the born, born physical stuff first, and then the digitized and the digital are the next things on the horizon. So uh, yes, it's, it's on our to-do list. It's even Brilliant. near the top. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. That's very good to hear. Okay. Um, right. Well, um, we're accumulating some questions here. So, um, so one for Holly, um, which is with the sensitivity of, of your archive subject area and the possibility of quite emotive uh, archive access, uh, such as dealing with sensitive terminology, have you got processes in place for ensuring staff and researcher well-being? Yes, this is a really interesting topic when it comes to women's data archive because obviously it's got a lot of sensitive potentially traumatic material involved and I think particularly when it came to the volunteer projects that I mentioned in the presentation we kind of realized there was an additional layer of a duty of care to the volunteers you couldn't just kind of have them in like a normal archive project and set them working with this kind of content hmm. so there was a bit of research there's a trauma-informed community of practice group I'm sure a few people are aware of and we also did a bit of research into just general trauma-informed practice, which has been really useful. Um, so we've created um, actually a volunteer handbook, which we give to the volunteers at the start of their projects, which kind of is just very transparent about what material they might come across. So we kind of mentioned the historic language, the themes that might come up, kind of just diminishing that element of surprise a little bit. Um, and point them towards resources that might help them. And then we also created a volunteer management checklist, um, which we kind of follow as staff members before, during and after a volunteer project. But it's, it's a super interesting question because this is such an overtly potentially distressing collection. But I think you can use it with all archives as well. There's always, I think every archivist has come across something that they've been a bit taken aback by in a collection mm. for one reason or another. So mm. it's an interesting debate. I think people are talking about it now. Indeed. And um, I mean, several questions on your uh, presentation. In fact, one from Michelle Williams. Uh, uh, will there be plans for ongoing discussions with women's aid and other communities represented within the records and as terms and contexts um, might change over time? Yeah. So, um, I think that's a big thing with all the historic terminology debate. You want to use terms that are 
kind of valid now. So like I said in the presentation, we're going to use victim survivor because that's what women's aid use. But this actually came up quite a bit in the LGBTQ plus um, intern project I also mentioned because they use focus groups to kind of figure out what terminology people represent themselves by nowadays. But we're very aware that in 10 years time, if not five years time, that might have completely changed and kind of terminology we use now might be offensive or just not quite PC anymore. So I think we're actually going to put a policy in place to review the terminology we use every 10 years or so, um, which I think is super interesting. And in terms of um, the women's aid collection and talking to communities, I'm kind of currently having a bit of debate in my own head about whether um, talking to actual women that use services is a legitimate and ethical way of kind of doing representation in archives because it's their story in the collection as well. Uh, the victim survivors themselves, but the ethics of approaching them and kind of making them potentially relive quite distressing uh, mm. times in their lives is something to think about. But I think even just speaking to Women's Aid or Feminist Archive North, going out and uh, talking to people that have an expertise more than your own and kind of accepting that that's the case uh, means that your archive is going to be documented in a way more kind of inclusive and representative mm. way. If that answered the question, I think I rambled um, oh, a little bit. No, no, I thought I, I thought that was a good answer. And if if I may, just a, a quick follow up on on terminology. I mean, this isn't new in a sense because past generations have um, adjusted terminology to their own um, world view. Um, and doubtless there'll be further shifts in the future, as you say. How do you ensure that the content of the record doesn't sink between la beneath layers of filtering? Um, you mean with kind of changing? terminology within records for your time. Mm. I mean, I think there's a difference between when, because we did a bit of work about kind of editing past records that might have historic terminology in. And I think it's important to stress that we're not changing any of the terminology that's from the actual record, because mm. that preserves what was said at the time. And it's a really important historic document. Um, and it's important that even if it might be offensive or distressing, that we maintain that that's what people said at the time but editing the archivist's voice and how it's described is kind of a different way of doing it if it's not in the actual record that's a different matter but even when you're editing perhaps the archivist's comment I think it's important to preserve that past description yeah, yeah sure and so we've been playing around with that because it's, it's very similar to the user generated content debate where there's not really anywhere to put in our databases legacy descriptions mm -hmm. but it's important that we maintain them um so we've kind of done a bit of a thing where we've put it in narratives in our emu database mm -hmm. and i so i think that's a way of protecting it from slipping through the cracks you're maintaining mm -hmm. it at the most recent um and the best way it is in the catalog but it's also there the past descriptions if researchers need to go back yeah sure yeah, Thanks, that's uh, that's yeah. great thank you and then, um, so this is all you, I'm afraid, Holly. So it's oh, attracted no. um, uh, a, a number of questions here. So this is um, from um, uh, Rizitsa. Uh, and the question is, you mentioned the use of contemporary terminology, for example, back of wives equals victim survivor. Um, will you publish a glossary of terms for others to use? Mm, I guess this Thank kind you. of weighs into um, the collections guide section. So obviously it's fair enough using all these different terms and represent historic terms and current terms, but having it in a collections guide that explains it to researchers, um, I think is quite important because it kind of just provides that context and helps them search in a way that's going to discover records the best. Mm -hmm. So I think a glossary would be pretty ideal and that is the goal um, because it's, it's a bit of a weird situation where almost if you search with quite an offensive term, you're gonna bring up more records than if you use the PC modern term, just because that's the one that's in the most collections. So maybe explaining that, although it's not nice, but if you search for battered wives in our collections database, you're gonna bring up a significant amount of records. And I think explaining that in a glossary, if not in just a general contextual description in a collections guide might be a good way of facilitating access. That's great, thank you. So, um, uh, 
Moving back to Giles, if I may. Um, Giles, could you say a bit about specific challenges you faced in the preparation and processing of the data? So on this specific pro uh, project, actually, it wasn't such a problem because the National Library of Scotland uh, makes their data available in extremely well-documented forms with, with lots of metadata, um, and both the uh, data foundry data, and Sarah Ames on the call, which I'm grateful to her in this collaboration, mm -hmm. um, and the authorities' data we got from behind the scenes. Uh, that was very good data. I, I feel there's a more general point, though, about the uh, necessity and the invisible labor, if you like, required in so-called data cleanup operations that don't really kind of credit uh, that labor sufficiently. And I mm. think it's a, mm. it's a good question, but in, the question brings out the kind of difficulties of many data sets that aren't often uh, accounted for sufficiently in project planning. And certainly my group as a whole often impresses on collaborators that this phase uh, in which it's you know, one really kind of has to think carefully about what the purpose of the data is, as well as what it really represents, and therefore its provenance and a whole host of issues. That is invariably uh, much more difficult and, and takes longer than people think. Um, the other side of this, I think, is that having uh, used such, uh, if, if you're lucky enough to have data of the, of the quality the NLS produce, um, there's an issue about how you represent what is in effect decades of curatorial labor and collections care yes. in that yeah. collections description. And if, as, you, as we're doing, one abstracts that, uh, that scholarship and that labor in the form of a machine learning model, I think it's an interesting question for ourselves yeah. and for the sector as a whole about how we accredit and um, credit that work. Yeah. Well, I suppose following on a bit from that, I was thinking as you were speaking, um, whether there is applicability of this technology, and I'm sure there is, again, it may be coming down the track, um, of machine reading to large manuscript corpora uh, beyond, for example, what the French Himanis project has done, uh, which has now been around for a while. Um, uh, so, you know, there are corpora like that, and then some vast runs of documents, um, uh, including many from the Middle Ages, um, that are too big to edit or print. And I don't mean too big individually physically, but just too voluminous, too many pages um, to devote that. And is there, a, is there a machine reading solution to this? Uh, there is, or there will be, or there's certainly kind of intense effort going on, things like Transcribus and the work of Read Consortium, uh, kind of various other projects that, really can only approach this over the long term. You need vast amounts of data and vast amounts of annotation. So again, we're talking about kind of clean up and labor and judgment yes. actually in, in processing that. Um, this has moved on a lot. In those, I first remember seeing demos of transcribers that were purely a technical interest, but I think they're now it's now a genuinely useful tool. And so, so some of the alternatives out there. I'm not myself a manuscript scholar and there are different sort of challenges. We've done things like sure. detect illustrations in manuscripts and detect marginalia on the sides of printed books. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, I think this is possible. And I think as well, once one gets beyond the, the notion of reading a manuscript, the sole kind of source of truth or, or information in the document, uh, there's really interesting uh, work on mise en page and diplomatics and, uh, and uh, scribal and identification. And all the rest, yeah. Okay, um, so I think again, um, uh, Giles, this one's for you. Um, and um, Melanie asks, um, could you say more about how this work might enable wider access to materials and, the, and their significance for audience development? Yeah, so um, chat books are paradoxical in a sense in that they are, or we think they are, popular culture for some, some value of popular for, for audiences that very often we don't know very much about. We don't know good literacy statistics specific for this, these periods, but possibly this material indicates wider literacy than the figures that we have indicate. Um, so although they're popular in historical terms, uh, it's not well-known material these days. Uh, the term is term chapbook is obscure. Uh, they're difficult things to make available very often but the, uh, for one reason or another, even, even, even digitally. Uh, descriptions aren't always great. The NLS is an exception, I think. So I think there is a, a lot of uh, opportunity for engagement, particularly through uh, communities' um, own printing histories, because um, the history of the chapbook is a history of the spread of the printing 
industry across the UK, among other places, um, from its emergence and, until the age of machine press. So uh, a printer sets up in a town. Uh, the first thing they do is print a popular, you know, well-known Jack book, or it might be a broadside ballad, because those are those are known commodities, if you like, they will sell. And, and they are commodities that are absolutely you know, part of the bread and butter of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of the industry. So I think, you know, that story about what was produced in, in a locality is, is um, one that uh, access to these materials can bring out. I think some of the methods that, I, and this is digitization in general, I suppose, mm -hmm. but I think some of the methods that I've shown provide an access point to the collections, which is quite interesting. So visual browsing, where you may not know the terms um, that one might search upon. Um, but if you can you know, simply kind of search by visual themes, or you have access to the text because of improvements in OCR, um, and those possibilities for increased discoverability. Great. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, and then I think probably, and this is likely, I think, to be the last question um, because we're uh, up against a hard stop at uh, 3.15. Um, but it's from Matilda Siebrecht, and I think it's for um, Alex and Faith, although actually it could be for any of our presenters. Um, so, a bit of a vague question, but just but as someone just starting out in a big digitization project of archaeological artifacts, what would be your top tip to ensure that the digital database can be more easily searched in the different ways that you've discussed today? So, I'll throw it open to all of our um, speakers, but um, perhaps Alex and Faith are... Um, since you've been speaking about a catalogue. Alex, do you want to...? No, you start, I think. <laughs> You're more aware of the linked data impact. Um, so I guess my top tip would be thinking about how you want to use the data, because you're always going to have to weigh up how much data, how much metadata you have the time and resources to capture about your artefacts or records. And so you're going to have to make decisions and you probably want to have, you know, depending what technology you've got, you're going to have some restricted vocabularies in terms of, you know, these are the ways you're going to describe the things. And so what you make available through that is going to be going to determine what can be searched on. So I guess thinking about your users and your user needs and what they're likely to be looking up. And the problem is for that, you probably won't necessarily know. You might think you have an idea and then somebody will come along looking for something completely different. So I guess just being um, au fait with the sort of fact that you're probably not going to capture all the stuff that they want first go out, but then have to review and revise and think about it as things going forward. But yeah, just having that think about the decisions you make on the metadata and what you make available through that those are going to determine the type of searches that your users will be able to do. So to think about the type of searches you want to support and you think your users need. So I think that's probably mostly unhelpful, um, but that's my top tip. And I just say, if anybody wants to discuss it further, Alex and I are on the TNA Snore tomorrow lunchtime. So along with one of my, um, one of our other colleagues, who's an actual mm -hmm. uh, archivist cataloger. Uh, so if anybody wants to come along and have a chat with us, please do. Great. Um, and Great. I've, throw it over to the others for their uh, top tips. Great, great intervention, great uh, answer. Thanks very much. So anything from uh, you, Giles, or you, Holly? I can't really improve on Faith's answer about thinking about users' needs, but also having a certain yeah. portion about one's ability to know what those are. Yeah, thank you. Holly? I just have a very boring answer of, um, uh, just making sure you nail the basic content of if you've got, I don't know, the basic description and the dates and all the boring stuff I was mentioning in my presentation, like subjects and authority files. If you've got the basic information there, you're doing kind of the most that you can for researchers. Anything extra is pretty good. It's a very boring answer. It's basically just catalogue it. But I think that at the end of the yeah. day, that's the best you can do sometimes. <laughs>